talking about the Church of Philadelphia today. Amen. We're in a series of Christ's sayings, last sayings to the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. We come in from Revelation 3, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. If you have it, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 7 says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that have the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Verse 8 says, I know thy works. Say, I know know thy works. works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Verse 9 says, Behold, I will make them of a synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and they are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all of the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of the heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that have him ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Revelations 3, verses 7 through 13. If I had a topic to give you all, you all may be seated. If I had a topic to give you all on today, as some of you may know, and I'll, I'll reintroduce it to you, is hold on to your crown. That is the message that Christ gave to the church of Philadelphia. Hold on to your crown. These last few weeks we've been studying, we've been teaching, we've been preaching about Christ's letters written by John to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is today modern-day Turkey for those that don't know. John wrote these letters as Jesus appeared before him. Jesus had him write these letters happening and of what was happening and is going on and what is going to happen during the times of persecution. See, the book of Revelation can be described as one simple phrase, things to come. This book has, this book as we have seen will encourage the believer. It will lift the righteous and the holy lives in the middle of an unrighteous and unholy times that we are in. This book will also challenge, it will convict the non-believer about the coming judgment if they continue to reject Christ. By definition, the church is just a building. It's It's a public place for Christians to worship. But by the Bible, which is the true definition, the church is a community of people that are awaiting its groom. See, the church is the bride of Christ. This is important for us to know to understand how our relationship with Christ should be. We must be patient. We must be loyal. We must endure as we wait for Christ's return. In Revelations 1 and 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. You must know that it is a blessing to read these prophecies from God. Many people are not able to read it. We're under grace, as as a lot of people like to say, but we can find truth in the hidden prophecies of God. 
1 and 9 says, I, John, your brother and your partner, your companion, in your affliction or the tribulation that you're going through, in the kingdom and the endurance or the patience that we must have, was on an island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, every letter has this special message from Christ. And we can sum it up as Pastor James has preached to us these past few weeks and the teachers have taught. But we're going to review a little bit, amen? amen? It's important to point out that Christ is telling us that I know thy works. Yes. Every yes. single church, he says, I know yes. thy works. Yes. For Jesus to say, I know thy works, it means that there was a level of intimacy right. between him and these churches. See, back in the day, me and Brother David, we used to go to school with, the, with the, probably one of the greatest basketball players in Raleigh next to me of all time. His name was John Wall. I used to say, I know John Wall. But now in present day, I can say, I knew John Wall. There's no level of intimacy there anymore. To know means that there is a present tense. To know means there is a past tense. This lets us know that Jesus Christ is always omnipresent. Right. He never leaves our side. That's right. And if you know, it is best to be known for the things that attract Christ. I can say that I know my wife because there are many things that attract me to her. There are many things that attract me to her because we know each other. That is the same way that the church has to be today. We have to know Christ, and Christ has to know us. We must do the things that attracts him. Well, what attracts him, Pastor Rod? What attracts him is us keeping his commandments, us loving our brother, us loving our sister. Revelation 2 and 2 for the church of Ephesus, he says, I know thy works, your labor, your endurance. You don't tolerate evil people. See, they tested or they tried those people who called themselves apostles, but were not. Verse 2 and 3, it says, suffered hardship. It said that the church of Ephesus, they suffered hardship for the name of Jesus. And through it all, you have not grown weary. This scripture gives them a warning of the judgment. He gave them a judgment. Christ had to give Ephesus a judgment. Amen. He says, but I have this complaint against you. You forgot your first love. Look how far you have fallen, the scripture says. Turn back to me and do the works that you first did. If you don't repent, I will come and remove my lampstand as it is a place in the church. See, the judgment of this goes back to us needing to do our first works, needing to repent and turn back to Christ. For the church of Smyrna, in verse 2 and 9, it says, I know thy works. He said, I know your suffering. I know your poverty. I know, but you are truly rich. And 2 and 10, it says, don't be afraid, though, of what you are about to suffer. Jesus says it in this way because it didn't seem like there was real suffering at the moment, but he was going to let them know that real suffering is going to come to the church in Smyrna. If the church in Smyrna had another name, I would like to call it the church of true joy. I feel like only true joy can allow a pastor to stand on a stake and be burned to death. In verse 2 and 14, it says, but for the church of Paradigm, we'll go back, 2 and 13. It says, I know that you love the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You remain loyal to me even when witnesses were martyred, martyred. But I have a few complaints. You tolerate some among you that have the teachings of Balaam. You have some Nicolaitans among you that follow the same teachings. He tells them in 2 and 16, repent. Repent, repent, repent. Jesus continually tells us anytime we see an error, anytime we miss the mark, we must repent. For the church of Thyatira in 2 and 19, it says, I know thy works. 
I have seen your love, your faith, your service. I've seen your patient endurance, and I see your constant improvement in all of these things. He says, but the judgment. He says, I have a complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, to lead the servants astray. She teaches immorality. She teaches them to eat food of the idols. I would throw her into a bed of suffering. I would strike her children's head. When we were teaching this in the youth class, I looked at the kids and said, what do you think Jezebel really looks like? We always hear about the spirit of Jezebel. But what does Jezebel really look like? And I said, after everybody had these different things, I said, I kind of, I pictured a woman, red dress, a little too short, cleavage out, makeup probably nice and neat, right? That's trying to lure people away. And then came the Super Bowl on Sunday. And I, me and my wife, we already made our mind up. We said, we, we, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna watch it. It's okay if you watch the halftime show, that's, that's on you. But we were convicted to not watch it. But the little peak that I did see, I saw Jezebel. Jesus. And all week long, people were complaining, what would you do if that was your wife? And I said, so what, what can you expect from a Jezebel spirit? Come on. Come on. There's, no, there's no real standard there for the world. What else do you expect from the world when the world has no standard to be tolerated for? Moving on, it says the church of Sardis, verses 3, chapter 3, verse 1b, it says, I know thy works, and you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you have heard and first believe. Jesus basically tells them to rededicate their lives, yeah, yeah. to go back, and do their, uh, go back and do their first works. Uh-huh. See, he says, go back and do a 21-day fast. Uh-huh. He says, you've done so much in your life that you forgot during that 21-day fast. I remember when, we, when I first got saved, I, I fasted for 40 days. 40 nights, we didn't watch no TV, we didn't listen to anything, we didn't just have any conversation. He says, go back and fast. Wake up in the morning and pray often. I I think I talked to pastor the first week that I got saved and I said I had this big old CD case. And I threw all my CDs out the window. All my secular CDs, I threw them out the window. God says, go back and do those things. It's time to make inventory on what you're allowing inside of your spirit, man. This brings us to our text today, the Church of Philadelphia, and Revelation 3 and 7. It says, write this letter to the Church of Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is true and holy. See, Philadelphia just is in a city in Pennsylvania, Pastor James. But they are known for the city of brotherly love. It was a city that was seated between Myasia and and Lydia. See, this was a city where lots of trade, lots of commerce happened because it sat in the middle of these two major cities. It was a name that was there before the gospel of Christ even hit the ground. They were a people who knew how to love one another and treat each other with respect without even having learned the gospel of Jesus Christ just yet. See, these grounds of Philadelphia, they were perfect place. They were the perfect place for the gospel of Jesus Christ to reside. In the book of Matthew and Henry, it says, Once sanctified by the gospel, the church of Philadelphia would then render them an excellent church to be an example for the world. I like to consider Philadelphia just like Capitol Boulevard. It sits right in the middle of Glenwood Avenue. It sits between Durham. It also sits between Garner, Raleigh, and and Johnston County. We sit right in the middle in the heart of what everything is happening. It doesn't matter what time of day that you come out here in Capitol Boulevard. More than likely, there's going to be some traffic. There's some type of exposure that God wants us to give to these people going up and down these roads. In this church, unlike most of the other churches in Asia Minor, Jesus doesn't find a fault. He doesn't find the judgment of this church. Although they were not perfect, there still was no fault. 
See, when there's no faults, that means that there were no fleshful faults. There were no physical faults. There were no mental faults or weaknesses of this church. But their love for one another in conjunction with their love for Christ covered all of their faults. 1 Peter 4 and 8 in the New King James Version, it says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. This is the message from the one who is holy and true and the one who holds the key of David. See, this is God's personal character that is being explained by John through Jesus Christ. Holy is his nature, and he cannot be anything but true to his word. Holiness is his language. He speaks in holiness. This key of David that he speaks of is is not an earthly key, but it's about his deity. It's about how strong he is. It's also a poetic way of saying that he has the key to our government. Amen. Verse 8 says, the one who has the key of David, what he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. He's talking about doors. And when I think of doors, I'm in construction. Doors do so many things. It it creates a divide between us and whatever is on the outside. I think about when I was growing up back in the day, mom and daddy said, don't you shut my door. Don't you slam my door. Don't pay no rent. Amen. There's front doors, there's back doors, there's, there's sliding doors, you got big commercial doors, you got residential doors. And then I met this lady the other week, uh, I was talking to her at the, the farmer's market, and she began to tell me about I, I was looking into the food that I eat. I was talking to a brother, and he convicted me. He was like, man, you got to really be careful what you eat, man. They, a lot of these foods, they sacrifice the idols. And I was like, man, this is, this is mind-blowing. I want to know where my food comes from. So I started going to the farmer's market, Pastor Matissa. And I asked her about the specific fruit she had. It was apples. And I asked her, I was like, now, how do you have an apple in the middle of the winter? We, we're in the winter. She was like, oh, well, I'm glad you asked. A lot of people don't ask these questions. So it's about the preservation of the apples. I was like, well, how do you preserve it if we're in January and they don't bloom until July or August, somewhere along that number? She said, I'm glad you asked. She said, our apples are grown in the foothills of the mountains of North Carolina. She said, and there's different levels To the apples. She said, the ones at the top, we know, hey, we're going to pick those and we're going to give them to the people in the summertime. She said, and as we go lower and lower, because of the shade that is cast over the apples, those apples are the ones that we're going to take and we're going to preserve them. So we'll be able to have the fruit in the middle of the season. I was like, okay, that's awesome. This is amazing. You know, so I was like, but you said there, there's two different ways. She, she let me know that there's two different ways to preserve an apple. She said there's naturally preservation, and then immediately, I think, unnatural preservation. She said, no, it's either natural or it's chemical preservation. I was like, chemical? That makes no sense, right? So it's either natural or it's unnatural in my world, the way I live. And so she said that, she said, well, the natural way to do it is the way that I just explained. The chemical way is they spray things on it and it'll preserve it throughout the year. Sometimes they grow them in greenhouses. They don't have seeds, all these other things. And we got into talking about melons and how a melon can't be naturally preserved. If it is naturally preserved, it'll just rot on the inside because the core on the outside is so hard. There's no way to preserve it. But then she gets to the point of, I said, where do you store them? She said, I'm glad you asked. She said, we take the apples that are preserved through the winter, and we put them in this big warehouse. She said, and there's a door. She said, there's a big door, and we know an amount of the account that has to be in there during a particular time, during a particular season. She says, we have a smaller door on the other side, and one person goes in. And when that person goes in, they check on them, they make sure that they aren't, uh, they're not rotten out, and they'll be able to go to the farmer's market, they'll be able to go to your local grocery stores and all these other things. She said, then there's this bigger door. She said, this bigger door is the door that we allow the forklift to go inside to actually grab the apples that we said were okay to eat. I was like, wow, 
This is amazing. All of this goes into place for us just to eat the food that we eat. It says that God opens doors and God closes doors. As the lady was saying, she said, there's only one person that can go in this door. She said, but when it's open, we must shut it immediately. Because we can't allow too much of the natural air to come inside. Because if the natural air comes inside from the, from the earth during this time of the year, the, the cold air, if it gets in there, if too much of it gets in, the apples will begin to rot in the season that it doesn't belong. The, immediately the scripture that came to me was in Psalms 1 there, where David lets it be known that your fruit shall bloom in and out of season. That's the kind of God that we serve. The, the fruit of the Spirit must bloom. He preserves you for a reason. Uh-huh. And only certain things you can let in during certain seasons. That's right, that's right, that's right. During the summertime of your seasons, sure, you may, be able to, you may be able to watch a football game. Sure, you may be able to go to this event or that event. But there's going to be certain seasons of your life where God is trying to preserve something inside of you. Because if you let it in, it's going to surely rot you from the inside. Acts 3 and 19, it says, repent then and then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. See, this is what we experienced last Sunday. That's why I couldn't speak on Sunday because the time of refreshing was there. And I highly encourage you, if you you missed out on it, whatever you prayed for during those times, you best believe that it's going to come to pass. We found that we have a new healer present in the house. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And today, someone who wasn't supposed to sing, this stuff amazes me. She wasn't supposed to be singing with us today, was standing right in front of us. It happened during the time of refreshing. Doors of opportunity open, opens us to receive the words from the preacher or the teacher, Mm -hmm. for the hearts of man to be open, doors for the church to be visible, doors of the church to be triumphant, but God also shuts doors. He shuts the doors to the sinner man or the agnostic that won't ask the questions that they desire to know. It's important, young people, I want y'all to hear me clearly. If you got questions, ask them while you can. Amen. Amen. One a young lady, she, she had this question. Pastor Rod, you said such, 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 such. Let's go to Pastor Matisha right now. No, 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 no. You need to ask this question. Whatever it is, whatever those things that you are struggling with, you need to ask it while they are here. You got a question about worship? Ask Pastor Tiffany. If you got a question about purity, ask Pastor Matisha. If you got a question about discipline, ask Pastor James, because the window or the door is going to be closed of the opportunity one day. See, God shuts the door for the stubborn sinner who hears warning after warning, but they refuse to submit to their own opinions and give them to God, or they refuse to change the course of their actions. God has shut the door of church fellowship to the believer who disrespected God's sacred grounds. See, these are people that they sing, they just can't find a church. They go, they go here, they go there, they go there, and they want to be a part of a church, but they can't because they cause so much chaos wherever they were. See, Jesus is telling us he opens and he closes doors. He speaks to his authority. It, this speaks to his authority and the authority that he has given to the pastors to speak to the church that he has chosen to conform to his holiness and his truth. Verse 3 and 8, my favorite part again, it says, I know thy works. He said, I have opened a door that no one can close. Jesus says, I've opened a door and I've left it open for you, the church of Philadelphia. See, one, he says, Christ is the giver of all liberty and opportunity that our church has. Christ takes notice that how long you've preserved yourself, how long you've cultivated your spiritual gifts, how long you didn't just take advantage of his grace just to do whatever you want to do. Unholy and lying people envy. They they resent 
what God has opened for you. These are the doors for us, and they wish to shut those doors. But Christ reassures us that as long as we remain faithful, as long as we remain holy, as long as we remain pure or righteous, he won't provoke them. No man can close a door that God has opened. In verse 9b it says, you have a little strength. He's saying a little power, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. See, this little strength, I, I, I was looking at it. I, at first I was like, man, God, Jesus, you didn't have to insult the church of Philadelphia like that. They got some kind of power. But as I did my studies, he says that this power, this strength, it, it was not taken as a judgment. Or it wasn't a reproof to this church. But Christ was speaking to the size of the church compared to the proportion of the area that they were in. Because of how small they were, there were many opportunities or there were many doors that they were given by the enemy to leave Christ's side. Yes. Jesus says, through all of these opportunities, you have remained faithful. See, Christ honors a people who may not be perfect, but they still walk in obedience. Amen. He honors a people that remain loyal to him. Hallelujah. He honors a people that will support the body of Christ, uh -huh. who confess and they continually repent. Amen. Verse 3 and 9 says, look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue. See, he gets real brutal. He says, those liars who call themselves Jews but are not to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love because you have obeyed my commandments to persevere. I will protect you from the great time and the testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to the world. See, God promises, God provides a divine favor upon his church. Amen. It consists of two things. One, Christ will make the church's enemies subject to her. Amen. See, in the scripture, the enemies are described as liars, uh -huh. those who call themselves Jews. These are people who pretend to be a part of the peculiar people of the body of Christ, but are not. They are people who wear the garments, but they're really wrapped in flesh. These are people who lack real conviction. These are the ones who deny the power, the conviction of the Holy Ghost. These are the ones who can shout it. These are the ones who can sing it. These are the ones that can make it sound good and look real pretty, but they don't have it inside of them. Amen. Amen. Only churches who worship God in spirit and in truth are God's true church. Amen. Churches who worship false gods or the ones who worship the true God in a false manner are the churches of Satan. They may profess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, but their profession in their hearts is just a lie. This is why when we look on TikTok or Instagram, you're looking at William Murphy dancing, doing everything that we used to do at A&T during a basketball game. This is why when you look up and you're seeing what's going on with the common preachers like T.D. Jakes and everything, and everybody's so surprised at what's going on, it's because what's inside of the heart of the man What's inside of the heart of a man Amen. has been a lie. Jesus says, they shall worship at thy feet. This is when those churches, they will admit that they're wrong, and they shall desire to commune with the true church of Christ. See, the power of God shall open doors of their hearts one day, and it will be opened by the keys of the righteous people of God. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. This is why it's so important for us to love our enemies. Amen. This is why it's so important. You got that, that cousin. You got that auntie. You got that brother. You got that sister. You, just, you know they ain't right. But you know there's some type of truth inside of them. See, God lets us know that there's going to be an opportunity where the door is going to be open. Hallelujah. And we have to be in position. That's right. That's right. That's right. We have to be at our post, Pastor James. We have to continue to be righteous and faithful people. Because when the opportunity comes for us to preach to those people, 
God is going to allow you to walk in it. And they're going to repent. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you got somebody you love, and you know their heart is hard, the scripture gives it life. They're going to come back. But you have to play your part. Let me get a tissue. You have to play your part. You can't get up out of, out of your way. You have to continue to be obedient. You have to be the example. You got to show them the love of Christ. Because they know the truth. They know the truth. Your brother knows the truth. Your sister knows the truth. Your father knows the truth. Your mother knows the truth. I didn't just grow up in church like this for no reason. But God is doing it for his glory. Hallelujah. They will acknowledge that you are the one I loved. Because the door is going to be open. Where the churches of Satan, they will repent. And if you are not in the right place, God, hallelujah, we will miss our opportunity to win people to the kingdom of God. This is the true victory of the believer. The favor of God. Consists of the promise to give the church saving grace to the most trying times. In the most trying times. This is the times of tribulation. Verse 3 and 10 says, I will protect you from the great time of testing and I will come upon the whole world. The days are upon us where tribulation is near. Every single sign, and we can't expect the president to make it better. Y'all can just go on. You can wrap that up. Nobody who you vote for is going to make any of these situations, any of these circumstances, any better than what it is. Don't wait on a musical artist. Don't wait on another preacher. Don't wait on another teacher. You got to make sure that you right. Because it's only going to get worse. The gospel of Christ is the testimony of God's patience with us. God has so much patience with us, it don't make any sense. He's got way more patience, way more grace than I could ever give you tell you, if I was sitting on the throne, I would have been wiped it out. I wouldn't have given my son. I wouldn't have done it. But God has a divine patience. He gives us divine grace. He said, I will protect you during the great times. See, this is the gospel. At the, at the moment in Christ's life, he could have chose to destroy us, but he chose to die on a cross instead. He withstood the test of life. But just to demonstrate that, it can, it can be done in human flesh just because he loves us so much. Therefore, every opportunity that he gives us to exercise patience, we must receive God's grace. Amen. But Christ makes it clear to us after patience comes a testing. This test will consist of trials and tribulation. That's why when we came out of Sunday morning, you woke up Monday morning, it just seemed like everything was out of whack. I was preparing to preach for this on Sunday. I woke up on Saturday morning, my knee was swollen. My knee hadn't been swollen since I played basketball in college, Pastor James. So I knew that God was working on something. See, these are trials and temptations of your faith. These are trials and temptations upon your heart. These are trials and temptations to see, will you really love God without even compromising? This is why soon as you start consecrating yourself, it seems like everything is falling apart. You decided to live a life of celibacy. And now whoever with double name, Bobo, Susu, Boo Boo, whoever, they decide to show up in your DMs. You decide to have a prayer life, and now your boss tells you you got to work at 6 a.m. on Friday morning. Uh-huh. Come on. You decide you want to start going to church. Now your boss tells you you need to work on Wednesday night, and I need you to work on Sunday morning. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. See, these are all tests and trials. All of these things are because of the enemy. He knows that if I can't get directly in them because they are completely submitted to the kingdom of God, 
I'm going to take control of everything that I have dominion over, over in their lives. But through it all, you must remain patient. You must endure. The scripture says weeping may endure for a night, but joy, it comes in the morning. Christ has reassured us that he will and he is protecting us. Verse 11 says, hold on to what you love. Christ calls us on duty to hold on and persevere through the trials and tribulation and to keep our faith, to keep his truth in our hearts, to keep his strength in his grace, and to hold tightly to the love for one another. All of this is treasure. This is, this is the real crown. This is the real gold, per se. It's, it's, it's worth more than any dollar in your bank account. That the enemy wants to steal from you. He, his job is to kill, steal, and destroy the kingdom of God. Amen. And it shall not prevail. He knows if he can break your friendships. He knows if he can break your family. He knows if you can lose sight of how graceful God really is or, or if he can just take a little bit of truth and pervert it into a lie just so you can believe it. He can take dominion over your children. In verse 11, it says, I am coming soon. Christ is coming. And all the signs, they're, they're ever before us in this moment. Christ is coming back to relive, to relieve us from the stresses of this world and to reward those who remain faithful and punish those who have fallen away. That's why that song was so amazing. Ride on King Jesus. No man cannot hinder me so that no one will take it away. The problem with the believer today is that we want to hold on to our crown and be perfect. And we want everything to be comfortable for us. We want to hold on for our, onto our crown while our bank accounts are full. We want to hold on to our crown while the preacher is only talking about our neighbor but doesn't talk about the things that we know that the Holy Ghost is convicting us about. As a Christian, you must always remember the reward is yours as long as you hold on to your crown. When you receive salvation for Christ, Christ gives you a crown. But in order to receive that crown, you've got to let go of some things. See, this is a principle. This, this can be applied to anything in your life. As a musician, in order to be a better musician, we've got to give up television. We've got to give up some video games. We, we've got to give up certain time with friends. and We have to dedicate time and practice. In college, they used to tell us, they say, you got three choices. You, you either got to get to sleep, you got good grades, or a social life. Choose two. Sleep, good grades, or a social life, and you only get to choose two. I tried all three. Tried, tried to balance all three of them. It didn't work. I'm just let you know that now for y'all going to school. If you're smart, choose sleeping good grades. Don't worry about the social life. It'll come. See, these are hard decisions to make when you're in the now of everything. Amen. But you have to think about the bigger picture. You can't think about what feels good right now. But see, the problem, the other problem with the believer today is we still want that right now reward. Amen. We come to the altar, we get prayed over, and we expect some little magic trick just to happen when somebody lay hands on us, and, and Monday will be perfectly fine. Don't you know that you have access to the same God that we have access to? The blood that works for me works for you. We have to depend on God to help cut out the unnecessary things out of our lives. But though it is all God calls us to, we must still be patient. We must still endure. When we do that, we can hold on to our crown of salvation. And no man can take it away from you. But he is the one who is the door opener. And when he opens the door, no one can close it. As we close verse 12, it says, All who are victorious will be pillars in the temple of God. 
and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens of the city of God. The new Jerusalem is what it's going to be called that comes down from the heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my name. Jesus makes it personal. He says he's going to write my name. He's going to write his name on us. See, Jesus promises that if you hold on to your crown, he will be your glorious reward. He says that you will be pillars in the temples of God. Now, this pillar isn't a, isn't a pillar. It isn't like foundation that needs to hold up the church because the church doesn't need to be held up by just us. The heavens don't need to be held up by us. But this is, this is like a pillar or a monument, kind of like the, the Lincoln Memorial of such. Except for this, it, it can't be moved, it, it won't be vandalized, it, it can't be made out of earthly things, it can't be made out of rock or dust or anything, but, but God is going to hold us there as his reward too as well. We are going to be monuments of God. Your crown is valuable. The enemy wants your crown as we close on today. You all may stand. Hallelujah. A few weeks ago, on Mortar Manor, Pastor Matisha, she gave us a word, and she said, what are you willing to let go of so you can leap? And ask the question to ask God to help us cut off those things that is holding us back, those weights, those things that are holding you down to the earth. Because your reward is coming. God has given you a crown. Some of you have given a crown. You've already received salvation. You're walking in the right light. But there's some weights in your life. Every head bow, every eye closed.